Uh, Matthew 27, and we're going to begin at verse 57 and read to the end of chapter 28. When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen and placed it in his new tomb, which he'd cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there facing the tomb. The next day, which followed the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I'll rise again. Therefore give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come, steal him and tell the people he's been raised from the dead. And then the last deception would be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers, Pilate told them, go and make it as secure as you know how. Then they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his robe was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men. But the angel told the women, Don't be afraid, because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's been resurrected just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly, tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. In fact, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. Listen, I've told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the good news. Just then Jesus met them and said, good morning. They came up, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they'll see me there. As they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ears, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been spread among Jewish people to this very day. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Our family's got a favourite television show at the moment. Well, we're binging on it as much as we can uh, using DVDs. And there's a line from that show uh, that started to be used in our family. That's a fact, Jack. That's a fact, Jack. Uh, It's a line used by a character uh, who's a little outlandish, who's a bit on the edge, and he uses that line to punctuate all his conversation, uh, to emphasise his statements, some of which are believable and some of which are over the top. But as I was watching it the other day, I thought, actually, that highlights a wider phenomenon in our society, the competition between facts and alternative facts, the competition between facts and alternative facts. You see, we now live in a world where there are facts and alternative facts. There's no such thing as a fact or the fact in our world anymore. There are facts and alternative facts, which if you actually think about what you're saying is an absurd use of the English word fact, isn't it? 
even more, when those two groups come together, those two different storylines, the argument doesn't seem to be dominated by evidence but by loudness, by assertion, by strident posturing. Let me tell you, that's not a new debate. It's as old as the Garden of Eden. Uh, There was a fact, and then Adam and Eve were presented with an alternative fact, weren't they? Did God really say? And around the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew helps us see alternative facts and facts meeting again. And Matthew's response in his Good News biography is striking and it's encouraging. Do you notice he doesn't use many exclamation marks? He doesn't use over-the-top language. He doesn't argue. He doesn't even get on his soapbox or hobby horse. He just gives us a simple account and leaves it to us as the readers to consider it. It's gentle, it's clear and winsome, and it's true. We're going to look at it now. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, it is so good to be gathered here with so many people and to actually face the facts as Matthew gently lays them out. Uh, Father, it is a glorious day. We come with many happiness thoughts in our hearts, but also many concerns. As we look at these facts and the presentation of alternative facts, please work in us to meet the one who is not in the tomb, but who is risen, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Jesus is dead. Uh, If the Romans knew how to do anything besides build roads and build empires, they knew how to do death, didn't they? They knew what death was. They knew how to check it. Jesus is definitely dead. The next step for the Romans is to leave his corpse on the cross as a decomposing warning or to take it down and throw it on the rubbish tip. They're the options. Uh, In the evening, though, a man called Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, a member of the ruling Jewish council, comes to the local political ruler, Pilate, and says, can I have that body, please? The man had had dealings with Jesus before. If you notice there, he's been discipled by Jesus. We're not told his motives. Perhaps he was a Jew who was offended by the idea of another Jew on a cross, naked and dead over the Sabbath. Perhaps he was actually deeply concerned for the dignity of the man at whose feet he had sat. Whatever his motives, Joseph has the means. And Pilate gives him permission. Look at verse 59 with me. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he'd cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. The body's taken down. The body is quickly, rightly prepared. Remember, he'd only been anointed a little earlier. That would have been a process in a hurried sense of about two hours where they bathed the body and wrapped it. Hard to stay unconscious in that time, isn't it? And then they placed him in Joseph's brand new handcrafted tomb and rolled a rock across the entrance. They're important facts to note, aren't they? A body left on the cross or chucked on the rubbish tip could be easily removed and a lie spread. But a body placed in a definite tomb with a definite location with a cover too large to remove, commissioned by a wealthy member of the Jewish religious elite, those kind of bodies stay where you leave them. And there are witnesses. Verse 61, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there facing the tomb. Did you notice that Matthew's good news biography started with women and finishes with women? Did you notice that at the start of the gospel, there are women on the outside, women of ill repute, women of bad reputation, and the women are still on the outside. This time they're the only ones left, aren't they? Everyone else has run away except Mary and Mary. They're loyal. 
they're persistent, they're persevering. And they sit opposite the tomb and watch everything that's going on. In wider society, they're still outsiders because as credible witnesses, you wouldn't call them in a Jewish law court. If you're going to create a lie, you'd need better witnesses than two women who are on the outside, but they see where the body's laid. It's an important fact to note, isn't it? There are eyewitnesses, and not the ones you'd choose if you're trying to create a decent lie. There are eyewitnesses, and they are consistent with the whole theme of this good news biography from beginning to end. And it's really interesting that Matthew describes them in such a way in the original Greek that he's inviting us as readers and saying, come and sit next to them, join them and watch what's going on. The next day is the Sabbath day. I'm at point three on the outline. The Jewish religious authorities would make sure they stay clean and pure on this day. But did you notice that their concern is so great that they go and hang out with the invading local governor? Their concern about Jesus is so great that it overcomes their devotion to this day of rest and they raise their concerns. Verse 63, Sir, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days I'll rise again. Therefore, give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come, steal him, and tell the people he's been raised from the dead. Then the last deception will be worse than the first. This con man, that's what it's literally in the Greek, this con man, he's not our king. You're our king, Pilate. This con man. He's about to create the greatest con in history and we want to make sure that he doesn't have a chance. Do you see that they name the deceit that they fear, that Jesus will be raised in three days? Do you see they name the solution? Seal the tomb. Put the guards there so that his disciples don't come and spread a lie. Pilate agrees, they get their guard and they set out to prevent this con man bringing this deception. Here are our two competing alternatives. Here are our two competing narratives side by side, just as they were in the Garden of Eden. God said, did God really say? Jesus said he'd be raised in three days. There is no chance we're going to let him. It's an important fact, an alternative fact to recognise especially in in the light of what Jesus has said consistently. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise in three days. He's gone to Jerusalem. He's been rejected. He's been killed. There's only one left, isn't there? And they're not going to let it happen. And it's important to recognise given the reasoning that Jesus gave for these events, why it's so important for his enemies not to let it take place. You see, if he's been raised from the dead, the ransom for sins is paid. If he's been raised from the dead, he really is the boss. If he's been raised from the dead, then the brokenness in our world, the brokenness we feel every day, can be healed. We've got to stop that deception and make sure the resurrection doesn't get out. There's the fact and there's the alternative fact. Well, early on the next morning, I'm at point four on the outline, the day after the Sabbath, Mary and Mary make their way to the tomb of Jesus. First one, chapter 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. It's important to remember that these ladies saw the burial, didn't they? They're not going to be mistaken. They sat there and watched. And notice what they're going to go and visit. They're going to go and visit the tomb. They're obviously not in on any great con, are they? They haven't been up all night whispering and stealing. 
they're just going to go and visit the grave. And events unfold that they don't expect. Verse 2, suddenly there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning. His robe was as white as snow and the guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel comes, the earth shakes, the stone is rolled back, the angel sits down, and the men who are meant to be guarding the dead now look dead themselves. And the angel speaks in verse 5. Don't be afraid, because I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's been resurrected just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. In fact, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. Listen, I've told you. Who's the first to hear the news? It's the outsiders, isn't it? The women. And do you notice that the news isn't dressed up dramatically? Do you notice that it's not using exaggeration or superlative? The angel just speaks very clearly, very simply, very reassuringly. It's empty. He's not here. He's raised from the dead. Come and have a look. Don't be afraid. Go and tell his mob. Do you see the simplicity of what the angel says? Do you see that the news of the resurrection is sent not to the insiders but the outsiders? Do you notice the invitation to come and have a look? And do you notice too that even though the soldiers are shaking like the dead, they're eyewitnesses too, aren't they? They saw all this. And so the women leave with that simple reassurance. Verse 8, so departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, good morning. They came up, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee. They'll see me there. It really is literally as simple as g'day. That's what it is in the Greek. Good morning. It's entirely in line with the picture we have of Jesus right throughout the gospel, isn't it? A man who spoke in everyday language to everyday people. It's a statement of fact by Jesus. The fact that he even spoke is wonderful. And the women fall and grab his feet. There's a bit of evidence. You can't grab feet that aren't there. And do you notice what they do with him? They worship him. That's emotional evidence, isn't it? You see, Jews only worship God. Jesus' words aren't deep. They're not even profound in many ways, are they? But the fact that they happen is profound. Corpses don't speak. And they certainly don't have ankles you can grab, and they aren't things you worship. Jesus speaks simply and confirms what the angel says. On any level of reasonable historical examination, the account of the resurrection stands up. Across the four good news biographies that we have in the Bible, all the key details are set and certain. Matthew's account, which we've been spending time in over four years, is consistent with his writing. It's not sensational. It's not exaggerated. It's not over the top. It just simply says, here are the facts. What are you going to do with them? Remember, we've been invited to join the women and to watch. The outsiders see it. The guards see it. The event is verified by examination, touch and emotion and it fulfills everything that Jesus said would definitely happen. The ladies head that way. The guards head that way. (laughs) Did you notice that at the very same time? Look at verse 11. As they, the ladies, were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, say this, His disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. 
If this reaches the governor's ears, we'll deal with him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money, did as they were instructed, and the story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. They couldn't stop the deceit, could they? The fact remains that the tomb is empty. The soldiers have seen it. Jesus is walking and talking. So a new deceit has to be created, another alternative fact, and it comes from the religious leaders. Using money, they calm the guards down. Using money, they create an alternative reality. Jesus wasn't resurrected. He was just stolen by his disciples. And the alternative narrative has so many problems. Now, if the guards were asleep, how did they know the disciples stole the body? If the disciples did steal the body, why do they all end up dying for a corpse they could pull out of the cupboard later on? If the stolen corpse is adequately explained by the way these men and women are transformed personally, spiritually and religiously, then doesn't that tell us that Jesus actually is alive? There's also the problem of an empty tomb. The other problem of the Romans having such power that they could have found the body if they wanted. And the final problem is that everything that Jesus talked about took place. As he said, when he said, even where he said. Facts and alternative facts. And do you notice that Matthew presents them side by side? So we can listen to them and we've been invited in to spend time with the outsiders and think about them. But there's one more step, isn't there? Because just like a lie went out into the world, so does the fact. Jesus meets his disciples as he promised and planned. They meet him. Some are overwhelmed and some worship him. And again, that's important to note. And then Jesus speaks to them. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus makes clear the consequence of the fact I'm the boss. And the news must go out. It's important to notice those consequences from Jesus, from his resurrection. He's not dead. He's out of the tomb. There is no enemy he cannot beat. And his claims are true and right. His resurrection says that your judgment for sin is paid for by a bloke who never sinned. His resurrection states the fact that he alone can deal with brokenness and we all want someone to do that for us. His resurrection says very clearly that God has beaten death and kept his promise and it's important to notice that that is a fact that must be spread. It must be proclaimed. It is news that persuades and transforms and must go out into the world. So here we are today. Fact, alternative fact. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus has done exactly as he promised. He's beaten sin, death and the brokenness in our hearts. Jesus is boss. Jesus' resurrection is attested by eyewitnesses logic and the bare events. As Uncle Si would say in our favourite TV show, that's a fact, Jack. But there's an alternative. The disciples stole the body and it's been a lie ever since, which is why we're here today. You see, we've just been witnesses with the other outsiders to that fact We now have to work out what we will do with it. There's a fact. There's an alternative fact. Which one makes sense of the events that took place? Which one explains life in general? Which one is consistent? 
Which one would change your life forever? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for Matthew, an outsider who met Jesus, an outsider who has written these facts down so that we can see them and know Jesus. Father, please reassure us that what we believe is true and consistent and life-changing. Father, please persuade us if this is the first time we've heard this news, that it is true and life-changing. And, Father, we pray that on a day like today and in the days ahead, this news will go out into all the world. In Jesus' name, amen.